The title today of today's message is I Am Jesus. Now, let, those who don't know me as well, let me just put your heart at ease. I realize I am not Jesus, okay? Uh, I do have a lot of issues. I have a lot of problems, okay? Uh, I probably should be medicated for some of them. But Messiah complex is not one of them, fortunately, okay? So I know I'm not Jesus, but Jesus made a number of statements in the Gospel of John that start with the phrase, I am. And he described himself in some very powerful ways. And there's seven of them throughout the Gospel of John. And today, I want to focus on one of them in John eleven twenty five, where Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, on the surface, you know, this sounds like nothing but amazing news, nothing but really good news. And, and it truly is. That statement, I am the resurrection and the life, is the foundation for the good news, the gospel that Jesus came in and took our place, right? And, and it is good news, but at the most basic level here, there, at the, under the surface level, there is a, there's a problem that we have to come to grips with. Even though it's good news on the surface, there, there's an issue un, just under the surface, if you will, that we need to be aware of. In fact, it, it's such a problem that this is the reason why the gospel is very offensive to so many. They want nothing to do with God. Because in order to accept the fact that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, in order to accept the fact that He is the Savior of the world, you have to first come to a place where you accept and realize that you need saving, that you're dead, right? And so, on the most basic level of that, we are all dead without Christ in our sin. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Because of our sin, the punishment is death. We have missed God's standards. Ephesians 2.1 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. We were dead in our sin. And that's why the gospel is so offensive. Because a lot of people don't want to admit that they need saving. A lot of people don't want to admit that they need help. That I can't do it on my own. That I can't save myself. And a lot of people have a hard time with that. But the amazingness of amazing grace is that Jesus did take our place. He did take our punishment. And he rose again. And because of that, if we've accepted him and made him the leader of our life, we can have and share in that new spiritual life, that new life to live forever with him. Amen? Amen. Amen. But for some this morning, it's not an issue of spiritual death. Maybe you've accepted Christ and He's the leader of your life and you're living for Him. But it's not an issue of spiritual death. You're feeling dead, rather, on the inside for a different reason. For some this morning, there may be, you came in this morning with a heaviness in your heart. And it's, it's very real and it's very raw. And in a moment of honesty, if you were to be really sincere, you would say, Pastor Mark, I just, I can't explain it, but I... There's something inside. I feel a little bit dead inside. I know I'm saved and I'm a Christian. I love the Lord, but there's something wrong. I feel dead inside. Maybe it was after you received some terrible news about a loved one or about yourself. Maybe you heard those awful words that none of us hope to ever hear, like cancer, terminally sick. There's nothing more we can do. And those are phrases that are very painful and difficult to hear. Maybe you're still deeply grieving the loss of someone that was close to you, someone you loved and has gone to the extent that you feel numb and dead inside. Perhaps it's your loss of job that has you feeling dead inside, feeling aimless and hopeless. Maybe you feel like you're in the midst of losing your marriage or losing your kids. Maybe it's a prayer that you've been praying for so long It feels like God is just completely forgotten. Maybe it's a friendship that was broken and it tears your heart apart. For others, maybe you look around at recent world events, at the tragedies in the world, the horrors going on around us, and you've begun to have this question surface in your mind, how can God allow all of this to take place? Is He really out there? Is the Bible really completely trustworthy? 
You kind of figure, how could all of these things be allowed to go on and God still be good? And you have doubts that have begun to rise up in your heart. If you can identify with any of those feelings or situations this morning, I want you to know you're in good company. I want you to know that even though we're not going to ask you to, if we were to ask people to raise their hands, I believe there'd be hands up all over this room saying, yeah, I've been there. Or maybe saying, yeah, I'm, I'm there right now. There's a part of me that feels a little bit dead on the inside. And not only have many of those around you walked that very path, those even closest to Jesus struggled in that same way. And what those close friends of Jesus discovered is what I want to sink deep into your heart today. I want it to get deep in your heart and in your spirit. And here it is. Here's what I want you to remember. God always has a plan to be glorified in the future through the tragedies of today. Let me say it again. Let that sink in. God always has a plan to be glorified in the future through the tragedies of today today. And this morning I want to look at the response of three people who were very close to Jesus. And each one struggled in their own way with feeling a little bit dead inside. Turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 11, verse 1. John chapter 11, verse 1. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. This is interesting. Jesus tells Mary and Martha, this sickness will not end in death, right? This sickness will not end in death. He's saying, in essence, this horrible thing that has happened, the worst news you would ever want to hear, that your brother is near death's door. He's so sick, Jesus recognizes right away that they think what they're thinking, that he's going to die. And Jesus looks at them and he says this, even though you've got this horrible news and you're seeing him lie there on death's door, what does he say? He makes this promise. This sickness will not end in death. And as we soon will see, Jesus' words are very careful here. He never promises that Lazarus will not die. He doesn't say Lazarus will not die, does he? What's he say? This sickness will not end in death. You see, you may face situations in your life from time to time that look like death is imminent, that death is the end. But how many people know this morning that whenever Jesus is at the center of his situation, whenever we put him front and center in our life and in our circumstances, it doesn't matter how bad it looks. It doesn't matter what doctors say. When Jesus is in the middle of it, when he's involved, it will not end in death. Jesus doesn't promise there won't be pain. He doesn't promise, he doesn't even promise there won't be death involved. But he says it will not end in death. Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Well, let's see what happens next. Rather than hustle off, you know, you would assume Jesus would get going, okay, we got to get to Lazarus, we know we're going to go help him out, we're going to heal him, and it's all going to be great, but no. Rather than hustle off, what does he do? Jesus actually waits two whole days. He waits there and does Absolutely nothing, or so it seems. He waits. He pauses. Why? It's not because he's lazy. It's not because he's uncertain what to do. It's not because he's not sure if he can do anything to help. Where God is concerned, there is always purpose in the pause. And some of you maybe right now are in a season of pause where God is saying, just wait, not yet, just wait. Just wait, hold on, hold on, not yet. You have a dream that you're trusting God for, a dream that God has put in your heart. God is saying, not yet, hold on. 
You're trusting for God to move in your life in a situation, in a circumstance. And God is saying, just wait, just wait. You're wanting to take a step of faith. You trust God and you want to make that move, that leap to say, okay, God, you're going to move here. But God is saying, whoa, hold on, hold on. It's not time yet. It's not time yet. And God is saying, wait. But do you know that there is always purpose in the pause? God doesn't have us wait because he's trying to figure out what to do. It's not because he's lost and has, can't find his way to us. It's because there's a purpose in the pause. So two days go by, Jesus finally decides to head out, right? And he's got to go through Judea to get to where Mary and Martha and Lazarus were. He's got to go through an area called Judea. And this has all the disciples alarmed. They're thinking, what? Are you, are you kidding? We're going to go? Because just a short while ago, all the religious leaders were out to kill Jesus, and they almost succeeded. Jesus barely escapes with his life. But again, Jesus was determined in his purpose, so away they went. But there was one particular disciple who wasn't very excited about this. It was Thomas. Read with me in chapter 11, verse 16. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. Let us, okay. We're going to go through Judea? Really, Jesus? Really? You remember what happened? Okay. Let, why don't we all go that we may die with him? I, I, when I read this, I almost hear the voice of Eeyore. It's Thomas speaking, like in the voice of Eeyore in my head, you know? And maybe I've just been watching cartoons too long. I don't know, but... Okay, let's go. Guess we'll die anyway. Might as well die with Jesus. Right? But some of us, kind of like Thomas feel a little bit dead in our doubts. Thomas doubted that they could ever make it alive to Judea, right? He remembered what happened before. It didn't, it, they barely made it alive last time. How are they going to make it out this time, right? He had forgotten Jesus' power, shown time and time again. He had forgotten Jesus' authority and who Jesus was. All he could see was, oh man, there's no way. It's impossible. It's an impossible situation. Maybe some of you this morning, you're feeling a little bit dead in your doubts, and there's that voice of Eeyore inside of you saying, Okay, there's no use. Why try? I give up. Oh, well, I guess God doesn't want to bless me. I guess God's not going to move. Oh, well. And, and we just kind of give up because of our doubts. Maybe... You're still questioning, as we said before, the, the claims of the Bible. You're questioning whether God's Word is really trustworthy. Could all of those amazing things really have happened? And you've begun to die inside a little bit in your doubt. Thomas was dead in his doubts. Maybe you're feeling a little dead in your doubts. Or maybe you're more like Mary. Mary, you see, was dead in her discouragement. Let's read in chapter 11, verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary, what's it say? Stayed at home. Jesus shows up four days after Lazarus had been dead and buried. He waited two days, took a two-day journey. It had been four days. Why did he wait? Before he gets to the house, Martha goes out to meet him. But what happens? Mary stays at home. I believe Mary, like many of us, would have been feeling discouraged, feeling dead in that discouragement. And we actually see her express that discouragement a little bit later. She does eventually come out to meet Jesus. Look at, with me at verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. You see, Mary was so upset, it deeply moved Jesus, we're told. She clearly believed that her brother's death could have been avoided if Jesus just would have come. If Jesus would have come when she first asked, then all of this sorrow and death could have been avoided. But now it's too late. 
right? What she says, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It could have been avoided, but now it's finished and it's too late. And maybe some this morning can relate to Mary's discouragement. You feel like, what's the use? Why bother? There's nothing that can change this situation. I'll always be in this dead-end job. I'll never be able to get out of debt. I'll never find Mr. or Mrs. Wright. I'll never have the healthy marriage that I hope to have. My kids will never come back to Christ. And you just keep hoping and hoping. But now you, you just feel dead in discouragement. And the hope for you is just about extinguished. Or maybe it went out a long time ago. Thomas was dead in his doubt. Mary felt dead in her discouragement. But Martha, I believe, felt dead on the inside in the delay in waiting. If we go back to the time where Martha uh, meets Jesus eventually outside the town, before Mary comes, we read uh, Martha's statement in verse 21. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Martha points out a few verses later down in verse 38, she, speaking of Lazarus, she says, He has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Now, I love the way the King James Version says this. If you have a King James Bible, it says, Lord, he's been dead for four days and he stinketh. Right? We, have, uh, we live out in the country, and if you live in the country, you know this. Uh, mice in your house and in your crawl spaces is just a part of life. It just comes with the territory, literally. And so uh, we, get, we have mouse traps set everywhere, and every once in a while, you know, you catch a mouse, and if you don't catch it soon enough, they begin to rot, and they begin to stink. And at one time, we had been gone for a few days. We came back in the house, and we, right away, we thought... Phew, what is that smell, right? And the closer you got to the crawl space, it just got stronger and stronger. And I'm telling you what, it didn't just stink. That mouth, mouse stinketh, right? And Lazarus, he'd been dead for four days. He didn't just stink, he stinketh, right? Stinketh is a whole other level of smell. Lazarus just wasn't a little bit dead. He wasn't just like, if you're a Princess Bride uh, fan, he wasn't just mostly dead, right? He was dead dead. He was all the way dead. And Martha points that out. He's been dead for four days. It's as if Martha was saying, Jesus, you took too long. And now it's too late. Nothing can be done. And she was feeling dead in her, the delay. And maybe some of you have been waiting for an answer to prayer. You want to believe for a miracle, but the longer it takes, the more you begin to feel a little bit dead inside in the waiting, in the delay. You look around and it seems like everyone but you is being blessed. They're getting jobs. They're finding Mr. and Mrs. Wright. They're having kids. Their kids are coming back to Christ, whatever it is. I remember a time not too long ago, right before we moved here to Spring Lake, Julie and I had been waiting to have kids, trying, hoping for over four years unsuccessfully, having tests done, not having any result. Doctors had no clue why. We were pretty sure what to do and doing our part, but it just wasn't happening. And whenever someone would get pregnant, one of our friends or family. We sincerely were excited for them. We really were. But can I be honest with you? There was a part of us that would ask the Lord in our hearts and to each other, Lord, why not us? What are we doing wrong? What are we missing? What's going on, God? And there was a part of us that began to die in the delay a little bit over the course of that four years. But what we began to learn through that experience, we, we had resigned that we would probably not ever have kids naturally. But, but regardless of what God was doing, we had made up our minds that we could trust God no matter what. That God was on the throne. And we didn't understand why we were having to walk this journey. And to us, it seemed final. But all the same, we made up our minds, we will trust the Lord and we will serve Him no matter what. Because though I don't understand the why, I know the who. Amen? Amen. 
and you may be going through something right now and you don't understand why. Why is this happening? Why have I had to wait so long? Why is this going on? Why hasn't God seemed to answer or move yet? Can I just encourage you, while you're waiting for the answer to why, never stop looking to who? To the Lord. That He is good. That He is trustworthy. And what Julie and I realized is that God always has a plan to be glorified in the future through the tragedies of today. And we praise the Lord today. A few years later, we have a a four-year-old son who's out there playing and having a good time. Then the Lord blessed us with another child. Miraculously, we we couldn't believe it. Timothy's now one and a half. And those of you, many of you know already, but we're expecting our third child in February. Praise the Lord. God is good. And some of you say, well, that's great for you, Pastor Mark. God did answer your prayers, but we're here still waiting. We're still here in the day, delay. But can I tell you, we didn't know God was going to move or when. See, the issue isn't, you know, why we had to wait or, or how long we had to wait, but we kept looking to the Lord. And I don't know when your prayer is going to be answered. I don't know when your blessing is going to come. But remember, where Jesus is involved, death is never the end. God has a purpose in the tragedies of today to be glorified in the future. Amen? God is on the move. And hold on to that and keep trusting that. I'm not going to make empty promises to you that I know how everything's going to work out and it's all going to be rosy. But if you will keep trusting the Lord, I believe and I trust and I know with every ounce of my being that God will help you see the purpose in what He's doing for you to continue trusting Him. Amen? Because it's all for His glory, isn't it? And so... Mary and Martha, they were about to experience firsthand God's amazing purpose. After expressing this frustration over Jesus' delay, Martha makes this incredible statement I want us to bring our attention to in verse 22. She's frustrated. She, She knows Jesus waited four days. But then listen to what she says. She says in verse 22, But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Right? Despite her brokenness and frustration, despite feeling dead inside, there was something inside of Martha, a spark and an ember of hope that said, but even now, even now, despite how I feel, all that's happened, even now in the midst of this pain and this anguish, even now, despite the fact that all things uh, look totally lost and impossible, even now, in fact, all things are possible. Read with me what happens next in verse 23. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha says, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. See, I don't think Martha even completely understood what it was the Spirit of God was stirring inside of her. Because she makes a statement, she just says, well, you know, I am the resurrection and the life. And Martha says, well, yeah, I I know we're all going to rise one day, and and that's all really great. But what does Jesus go on to say? He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Verse 27, yes, Lord, she told him, I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Notice Jesus didn't say, I can resurrect and bring people back to life. He doesn't say that. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Because resurrection is not just something Jesus does. Listen, some of you need to hear this today. Resurrection is not just something that Jesus does, but it is who Jesus is. Is. It is who he is. It is part of his being, part of his character. And if Jesus is alive in you through his spirit, guess what? That same resurrection power lives inside of you as well. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the power. So what happens to Lazarus? Jesus goes into town and he goes to the grave and everyone there, we read, they're weeping, they're crying. And Jesus tells a group of people, remove the stone, take the stone away. And he stares into the empty blackness of that cave where Lazarus 
lie dead and stinketh? And Jesus looks into that cave, and for some reason in my mind, I always picture him pointing. So I always point when I say this. I don't know why. But, but I just picture Jesus looking into that blackness of that tomb and saying, Lazarus, come out. And he calls to a dead man to come to him. And I can imagine you could have cut the tension with a knife. You would have heard a pin drop as everyone waited in eager anticipation. What's going to happen? And right before everyone's eyes, and to everyone's amazement, here comes Lazarus walking right out of the tomb. Brennan, if you'd come up, please. I want you to know this morning that the same Jesus and the same voice that called Lazarus out of the tomb and brought him to life is calling you today. He's calling you out of discouragement, to walk out of discouragement. He's calling you to walk out of hopelessness, to walk out of despair. And as impossible and as unimaginable as it seems to you today, let me tell you, you can be free. You can be forgiven. You can be strong. You can make it. Because God always has a plan to be glorified in the future through the tragedies of today. Will you respond? Will you answer Jesus' call to come to Him? Jesus doesn't need us to figure it all out. He doesn't need us to have it all figured out before we come to Him. You might still have some doubts. You might still feel a little discouraged or frustrated in the delay. Let me just tell you, that's okay. Come to Jesus today. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Let the power of the resurrection, let Jesus himself fill you with fresh peace today, with fresh hope, with fresh strength, fresh forgiveness, fresh freedom. Let me just tell you something important here. No one's promising you a problem-free life. No one's making empty promises here. Listen, it's not as if bad things never happen again to Lazarus or the lives of the others. Guess what? Jesus hasn't come back yet, in case you haven't, didn't know that. He is coming soon, but he hasn't come yet. And what does that mean for Lazarus and Martha and Mary and all the other disciples? You know what it means? They died. They died again. Lazarus eventually, I believe, grew old and eventually died. But that doesn't negate the fact that Jesus is the resurrection and the life because Lazarus didn't stay dead the second time either. He was brought to life again, this time for eternity. And even though they all died, and in fact we read from church history that of the uh, 11 disciples that were left after Judas, 10 of them were tortured horrifically before their death. You know what that tells me? So the Lord doesn't promise us a problem-free life. In fact, we're promised the opposite. That in this world, there will be many sorrows. But guess what? That doesn't mean we walk through life without joy or gladness because the Lord's mercies are new every morning. And because we serve a Lord who is living and alive, who is the resurrection and the life. And this morning, you can be brought to life no matter how long it's been, no matter how hopeless the situation seems, no matter how long you've been believing. Maybe inside you've just given up. But the Lord wants to resurrect hope inside of you today. He wants to resurrect strength and encouragement today. Maybe some of you are kind of like Martha and there's just barely an ember glowing of hope. Maybe not even that. This morning, will you just allow me to fan that ember into flame? To stoke those coals to come to life again and to burn into a flaming fire of encouragement and strength by the Spirit of God today. We serve a God who doesn't just resurrect, but is the resurrection today. Would you stand with me this morning?
how many of you by lifted hand this morning will declare, despite what I feel, despite what I see, despite what is going on, I will commit to the resurrected Lord. How many of you would just say that by your uplifted hand this morning? Thank you. You can put your hands down. Some of you, though, that's going to take an incredible step of faith, isn't it? For some this morning, that's going to take a huge step of saying, Lord, I trust you. I want to have a little bit of time with you to, to pray with you and believe with you. I'm going to ask Pastor Pete in just a moment to come in and pray with me, but I'm going to let you conclude, Pastor Pete, but maybe we can offer to pray for those who maybe you need a, a special touch from God. Maybe you've been believing for so long, you're not sure how to take that first step. I want to pray and believe with you. Maybe like the man Jesus healed, Jesus said, do you believe? And the man said, I do believe, but help my unbelief. Maybe you need some help. There's some doubt still that you need the Lord to help you with. Pastor Pete and I want to pray with you and help walk with you to invite you to step out, to take that step of faith and step out of that discouragement, step out of that uh, frustration and the delay, step out of that despair and walk in renewed hope, renewed zeal, renewed strength. Amen.